Hi, this is uh, Koiru with uh, another short uh, video for you. A fellow retro enthusiast and Commodore uh, connector reached out to me and said that he had a monitor that he wanted me to look into. And this monitor is uh, 1084 ST. And Commodore was really the strange breed of company. They was known to ship whatever they had laying around and you can actually get Commodore computers with serial numbers that's really close by each other and the inwards and the keyboard and other things could be really dissimilar. And some of it, this is due to back in the 80s, you had lower quality control on boards and stuff. So they used refurbished boards when there was a board in a computer that didn't work. They actually swapped the whole board and sent this to a different facility for um, error checking. So that's why some boards was picked out of the production line and some new boards was replacing those. And this I remember from back in the day too when I was doing service on Commodore equipment. What we get sent as new parts from Commodore could be refurbished stock. But this episode is supposed to be about monitors and here Commodore had a, a similar approach. Commodore has never been a manufacturer themselves of monitor chassis. They have done some circuit design and some other stuff to make this compatible with those machines that the monitors was intended to, but they mostly outsourced or all the time outsourced the manufacture of the monitors themselves. And all the earlier monitor is manufactured by Daewoo or Philips or some of the earliest Amiga monitors actually was sourced from JVC or Toshiba. But the monitor we are looking into today is one of the 1084 range. And this is really a broad range. I have owned several 1084 uh, monitors. They are all kinds of 1084s out there and I actually owned one 1084D and one 1084P and probably also a 1084 with no other letters trailing it and then you have these variants the 1084SD, the 1084SD1, 1084SD1 with white badge and you had 1084D2 1084D2 in black and 1084SP, the 1084SP1, SP1 black, 1084SP2 and this is the monitor that I actually will be looking into in this video and this is a 1084ST. And of all the 1084 monitors, this is the least known and it was only in production on the trailing life of Commodore and actually some of these monitor is manufactured with a date that says that this is made after uh, Commodore's bankruptcy. The monitor was originally launched in 1992 and is produced by the company that's called Leecom and it's the only Commodore monitor to come out of this company. You can see that all the other 1084s is made by Philips or Davu. And the Philips and Davu monitors has schematics available online, but on this monitor I have not been able to find anything. So troubleshooting this monitor is a bit of reverse engineering and trying to figure out how things work. The board itself seems to be of good quality and they have used marked parts. So it's not the way that some OM manufacturers do, where they use unmarked ICs or they scrape off the top of the ICs to make it more difficult to source parts from without their own supply chain. But here yeah, they have used known chip manufacturers like ST and Philips and some of the others. And the picture tube in this monitor is made by Philips. All the other monitors in the 1084 ST range 
has known problems, but the problems for the 1084 ST is more unique for this special kind of, uh, of monitor. All the other 1084 S, it's very common to have bad solder joints, to have bad flyback transformers, to have bad line drivers, and also some power supply issues with switching transistors and, and so on. But on the 1084 ST, little is known as common faults. And if you can continue browsing to these Commodore monitors, you can see that they actually have quite the range of monitors. Some of these earlier monitors is really well known and highly sought after by enthusiasts. Even back in the day, they have different breeds of the same monitors like the 1802 and 1701 and, and so on. But this is the only other case where I've seen that monitors with the same branding is made by different producer as the 1802 beige monitor is made by Goldstar and the tall and the gray badge and the D version is made by uh, Davu. Here we come to the VGA monitors and the later monitors with only analog input in the shape of a 15-pin VGA connector. Here they are all over the place when it comes to manufacturers and model and naming of this stuff. So you can see they also actually source the monitor from Nokia and they have mixed Samsung and Davu and AOC. Lighton, Fujitsu, Philips again, ADI, Multitech, Iliama, Matsuhita, Microitech, and so on. So they sourced their stuff from all over the place and they actually slapped Commodore badges on whatever monitor they seemed was within specification. And this of course makes maintaining schematic libraries and spare parts and so on uh, a nightmare but this was the introduction to this repair and we will actually look into as i said the um, 1084 st in this uh, video this will be a two or three part video Yes, from the outside the monitor looks to be in excellent uh, condition. You can see this is the variant with the Commodore badge in front. And here you have the, the volume, color, contrast, brightness, and we also have the mode switch for RGB or CVBS composite video. And you also have a headphone jack here in the front. Yeah, and on the back we have the uh, RGB uh, connector. We have the inputs for the um, composite video, audio and uh, Luma signal. And you have the controls of vertical size, vertical shift and horizontal size. And the controls looks to be in good order. And you also have the power switch in the back. That's it for the back side of the monitor. So let's now try to open the case and see what lurks inside. The cover is fastened only with four screws and then you pull it back out. And what's special with this monitor is that the tilt and swivel base is not connected to the case as it normally is. It's connected direct to the chassis. So this will be left on the monitor when we take out the back cover. This badge states that we under no circumstances should take off the back cover, but we won't listen to that, do we? And off it goes. Yes, now that the cover is off, we first do a, a manual inspection to see that everything looks okay. And this monitor looks almost unused on the inside. No dust and no static collection of dust or heat or, or anything that you can see. Of course, we can be fooled that someone has cleaned up real good in here. But if the components has been accessed to, to heat, there would be some marks on the circuit board. 
And here I can see only some small marks around some resistors that there has been heat in, inside here. And we also try to check for bad continuity with taking the, the plugs and shake them a bit. This has a, a Philips monitor as we stated earlier, so at least that's right regarding the specs. But we can see no obvious faults in here, and since the monitor does not light up, we do suspect that there is a, a power issue, but it also can be some issues with line drivers and other stuff that has so much strain on the power supply that it won't start. I think this is a line delay driver uh, I'm not sure, I have never seen this kind in a computer monitor before, and it's on an extra card, that's... I'm not sure why it's there. Everything looks nice and, and solid, and all the caps looks like they're okay, at least they have not leaked on the, the circuit board. And generally caps from this area, you should be a bit suspicious about them, but normally they have some kind of leakage or bulging or miscoloration or something if they are bad. <coughs> the first thing we need to check if the supply voltage chain is okay, so we measure into the connector, into the power switch, and we take and measure the signal straight through to the rectifier to check that uh, the 230 volt is actually reaching into the circuit. In this monitor it is a bit tricky because it's some narrow space and I forgot to mention that I already measured the fuse and the fuse is uh, okay. And it looks to be an original fuse and has not been replaced either. And we quickly found out that the 220 volt circuit is actually reaching the rectifier and that the rectifier itself is okay. It's getting late, so I think I will continue the um, fault finding mission tomorrow. Uh, I will just take some uh, quick measurements of some resistors and other stuff that I can rule them out as suspicious uh, components uh, when I continue tomorrow. I will also try to do a new search on um, the internet to find a schematic for this monitor, but I don't uh, hold uh, high hopes for that. Hi, today I'm uh, back in my shed again and taking a second look at this uh, 1084 ST model and as we stated yesterday it was totally dead and what I'm just going to do is to measure out all the active components on the, the primary side of the switching regulator. The fuse was not blown so in any way it's probably not uh, a short and some components tends to fail open and some tends to fail shorted. And if there is a capacitor that fails short, it would probably smoke and make a havoc. And if there was an um, active component as a diode or a transistor or something that fails short, it also tends to get very hot and smoke and take out the fuse. But resistors, they often fail open, so there could be some of that. There could be some other issues with the switching regulator, that the regulator is not starting. And if this regulator is not starting, it's normally either because the, it's uh, a fault in the switching transistor or thyristor, depending on what kind of, of construction it is, or it might be the switching regulator, which we see down here, that is a TDA4605. That's both a switching regulator, a current sensor, and it's found in a lot of Philips construction from the late 80s and, and mid 90s. So I'm just going to measure out the rectifier and the um, diodes and the um, switching transistor itself. just have my sheep multimeter today, the other one is down at the office. Normally I use the, the fluke scope meter for this kind of measurements. 
Yeah, we can also see that there has been done some work on this before. It's not very easy to see on the shot we got here, but we do have some work that's been done here. This is the regulator for the, the line, the line transistor. And there is a potentiometer here for the um, width that's also received some work. And there also are some work done here on the input. But I say there are some work done and that might not be the case because on some of these older constructions like this many of the components was placed automatically by a pick and place machine but some of the components could not be picked or placed or soldiered and they was mounted by hand later on and this could actually be components that was placed by hand afterwards and that's why the soldier joint was not cleaned up so that you can see flux and that they are more shiny than the other soldier joints. There could also be someone that has been in here before and tried to fix this monitor and just have freshened up some of the soldier joints that looked suspicious. But now on to the task at hand, that is just to find out what's fault. And on this PCB here, you can see all these holes here. And these holes is to make some extra space to separate primary side of the switching or the, the hot voltage side by the rest of the circuit. So that's not uncommon to see that is divided by these holes and just not the space on the um, PCB. Yeah. I actually now can see some other holes here. There are some soldering down here that's not look good. But I do think there is contact. I will find out of that once. If it's contact from this to this. So that's not our problem. But I will just now take and measure out the active components. This is the rectifier down here. And that measure out just fine. So everything is okay that far. Down here we have this transistor switching one. And that also measure out. Yeah, it measure outs okay. And the diodes, they have I measure from top. I have some more diodes. Excuse me that I can't capture this on, on film, but I have some problems with the camera angles and showing what's inside this monitor. This is okay. And that is okay. And I have this resistor here that has received uh, some warmth. See how this resistor measures out. This is the only place on the PCB there, are, there actually has been some heat. Yeah, okay. I have to check what sizes each really should be. I will try to get in there and see what kind of value it should have. It should have it's the RP05 and RP04. As it is impossible to get a good schematics for this, it's a bit trial and error. But we know that this is a power supply fault and I will start with the most obvious things as I stated. But I do see some cracks in some soldier joints here. But the first thing I will do is to take out one of the power resistors that I looked at earlier because I can't figure out what one of them has for a value. It measures at 11k 
but I can't find any writing on the viewable side on this so I'm just going to take it out to see if this is the right value or that the value might have changed if this is getting too hot this is the burger right here it states 12k I thought it was 2k but it measured like 11 when it was in the circuit so I'm just going to check it again yeah, it actually is a bit low it measures as 11.1k and this is a uh, 5% 12k ohm I will put on these magnifiers to, to read this correct. Yeah, it's 5% 12 kilo ohms, and 5% that's about uh, 600 ohms. It's way lower than that, so I might have to replace this. And this is something that stands in immediate closeness to the TDA regulating chip, so we might have to look into that. But at this point, I think I will just order a new ship and have a go at that. The TDA4605 that is used as the regulator circuit for the switch mode in this monitor was quite a popular part. The pinout is quite simple, you have the regulation input, primary current simulation, primary voltage monitoring, ground, zero crossing detection, soft start, supply voltage and output. And the pin's function is described here. Pin number one is the regulating voltage, primary current simulation and this is the primary current rise in the primary winding is simulated at pin 2 as a voltage rise by means of external LC element. And the resistor that we desoldered was part of that network together with another resistor and a capacitor. Primary voltage detector, the primary voltage, is the input voltage and this detects the line voltage that's retrofied and feed into the circuit. We have ground, you have the output, and this is the push-pull output for charge and discharge of gate capacitance of the power most transistor. And this is the output for the switching transistor. You have the supply voltage, and the supply voltage is actually the referencing voltage for which the circuit is trying to establish the output voltage. You have soft start can have touch buttons and stuff that will start up the circuit or you can start it by means of a signal from an other external source and you have zero detector that's an input for the oscillator feedback and that is to make the the switching of the um, primary voltage occur when the 50 hertz signal is passing through zero and they also have a, a small block diagram here as you can see, this part is the integral part of the switching, and as long as the MOST transistor that does the switching is okay, little else is going on in this switch mode power supply without this chip being part of it. So that's why the decision of replacing this came at hand. So that's it for this first episode. So, thanks for uh, watching. Hope to see you again real soon in a follow-up to this uh, video. I will check where I can order this part in the speediest way.
See you in the next one.